Uh, yeah, uh, you will excuse me if I sort of look too much at my notes. I usually try to riff a bit when I'm doing PowerPoints, but the last time I did that, I spent a lot of time talking about cheese. So I'm going to stick. <laughs> I'm going to stick sort of this kind of angle. Um, so, yes. Um, so in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to be discussing the public perception of archaeology in the media, uh, about how we are most often perceived, how this consequently affects our discipline. <laughs> To tie into the theme of time, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the past, uh, quite a great deal about the present, and touch lightly on where we can go in the future. Um, as you can see behind me, I have a quote from the 2007 Britain Clack introduction to their book about archaeology in the media. Now, if you read that in the voice of the movie announcer, it sounds horrifying. We cannot escape the media. The drums in the deep. We cannot get out. The quote is rather dramatic, but it is fairly accurate. We cannot escape the media, and nor should we. The media has surrounded us since the beginning, with several newspapers funding archaeological digs, particularly in Egypt. It seems apparent that the way in which we interact with certain forms of media are now lacking. It results in miscommunication, outcry, and abuse over generally accepted theories and a lack of interest in our subject in a time which we cannot afford to be without significant awareness from the public. For those of you out there who have had experience with discussing something archaeology related with a journalist, it is quite common to come out of such meetings with the feeling that half of what you said will be missing from the final edition. Part of this boils down to a journalist not understanding archaeological method and theory, which is not really on the fault um, of the journalist but also their incessant habit of following the usual tiring ideas behind communication with the public. The idea that the public needs drama, needs ludicrous graphics, and eye-catching headlines in order to gain interest. This is certainly not always the case, and many local newspapers and radio shows in particular do an excellent job of reporting on archaeological excavations in their respective counties. However, there is quite rightly a great deal of mistrust in the media on our part as a result of this. Therefore, I'll be discussing other methods available to us like social media, and whether they are a successful tool that can help us cut out the middle person and sift through the terrible dramatics of archaeological television in particular. To that end, I also created a survey, and it could be that one. Oh yeah, that's a bit of good TV. Uh, <laughs> that and I also created a survey and sent that out with some help from several people on Twitter. Um, I, when I first started, I asked a few people with large followings on Twitter to share it out as much as possible. Um, a guy called Greg Jenner, um, who does the Horrible Histories uh, TV show, um, I asked Danny John Jules, who's the cat from Red Dwarf, and um, I asked uh, Dr. Alice Roberts, who does Digging for Britain. Um, and they all did so and have got a massive, well, a decent sized response, which was useful. Um, and so my main hope for the survey results was that I would be able to get some idea of where exactly people get their information about archaeology and what the public impression of an archaeologist even is. I'm going to talk a lot about the big beast that is the media, but I also include in this basic interaction with the public, uh, even on a one-to-one -one level, as this also serves to shape the general idea of our profession. So what the survey did show was that the 549 people, I know, amazing, who replied to the survey got our ideas of archaeology from a wide range of places. And also this, which is just point out. <laughs> so yeah, um, people on the internet are also absolute liars because only two people said they had absolutely no clue whatsoever. And I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> and even people who are interested in history appear, we appear as a bit of a mystery to them. This is the bit that I like the most. The phrase most repeated by others is often we don't really know what they, why they did that or what it's actually for, and it's basically guessing. Thank you to that definite guy who said that. I'll be first to admit that the survey was not perfect, although perhaps it was never designed to be, and it was very difficult to break out of specific social media bubbles to reach a wider audience. But it was, if nothing else, a very useful experiment on the potential social media has to promote our profession in the future. As we all know, whether we like it or not, Indiana Jones and Lara Croft resemble one of the first things that people associate with archaeology. Unless, of course, people get us confused with architects, which seems to happen quite a lot. 
Um, I myself used to make the joke that one of the archaeology university modules I went to was entitled Bullwhipping 101, a guide to outwitting the Nazis. <laughs> and who would have thought that in 2017, outwitting the Nazis would have become relevant again? The rather worrying rise of the so-called alt-right means that we must be more ready than ever to help make sure archaeology is not misrepresented by white nationalist groups, as it so often has been in the past. It does not take much to delve into the history of archaeology to see how intertwined it has been with racist ideologies. While there are still places across the country where we still exalt men like Flanders Petrie and Moa Wheeler, despite their incredibly problematic outlooks. Indiana Jones is the quintessential treasure hunter that we should really confront, especially when considering the problems linked to heritage crime this stems from. That goes back to that 95-year-old woman. Should we be beholden to the idea that any publicity is good publicity. It's a bit of Flanders Peach. There's one point in particular I tried to see how easy it was to analyse through the survey. Should we simply be happy with what we have? I'd argue absolutely not. It's part of our job to present the past in a way that is accurate, informative, inclusive, and above all else, to present the past in a way that can be accessed easily by everyone. If we keep this information between ourselves, if we keep people at arm's length, or even worse, allow people from outside of our profession to dictate how we present archaeology, then it is of no surprise that there is a lack of interest in what we do. The result from the survey was surprisingly insightful, despite the fact that a lot of people who completed the survey informed me that it would not be. It shows that the public get their information from a wide range of mediums, with television, museums and books being the highest percentage. Interestingly, despite radio programs arguably being the most reliable, they were not often mentioned within the survey results. This is more possibly linked to the fact that radio is declining as a communication platform more than anything else. One thing that was frequently mentioned, which was interesting, was that people enjoyed archaeology appearing in other platforms, particularly the hairy bikers for some reason. We have several times in the past used archaeological evidence of food production in their cooking shows. You can see that there. This in particular is a great way to further our profession, and experimental archaeology should be at the forefront of these methods. A hands-on approach such as this works incredibly well for all levels of media, and is an excellent gateway for further interest in the subject. Instagram, Twitter, and television would all be successful mediums for this, and emphasis on the practicalities of archaeology, further, how they further education has been trialled in the past by myself, and the results, which were small scale, were productive. Although not perfect, this survey was vital in furthering the understanding of the public understanding of archaeology. The comment section in particular was very insightful, and I've got a few favourites here that I just thought I'd show to you. Um, this is all about Time Team, I think. That's it. This is, this is it, this is the one. Um, that just says, if you were a genuine archaeologist, blah, 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 blah. Archaeologists are human and make mistakes. They're nowhere as clever as they would like you to think. So <laughs> just remember that next time you mention something on the internet. Although as archaeologists we tend to see ourselves as a particular, generally cohesive entity. Ooh, that's some more tab ones. Oh yeah, Tony Robinson's a bit of a pompous out. That was a good one. I really like that. Uh, yeah. But some of these some of these were, you know, very good. It was interesting. This one about um, great it being a great social leveler, huge and popular with the less able, less motivated peoples. Um, and you get that similarly to how Operation Nightingale is working currently. Yes. I'd argue that a very di important difference is in the structure of the public perception of archaeology between commercial and academia. The problem we face in archaeology and the media is it's presented overwhelmingly from the academic perspective, particularly with shows like Digging for Britain. I am without a doubt a fan of the show. I think the presenting style from Dr. Alice Roberts is superb, and the work highlighted across the country is fantastic. Um, but I see several drawbacks that hinder its success. These drawbacks can't be laid at the foot of Alice Roberts. The work that's presented or the people appearing on it is more to do with how the editing takes place in the show and the method in which the on-site filming takes place. These drawbacks come from how we've been presented by the media since the very earliest beginnings of archaeology and how we've had a complete inability to change the very mechanisms behind our relationship with the media. In our current economic climate, with our current government, and with the current state of the heritage sector, there's a serious setback for what is arguably our most accurate and representative programming to solely appear on BBC4. If the best we can really manage is terrestrial television, then we're clearly not doing enough, and it will have a serious impact on us, and debatably, already has. Now, although I read several comments from my survey about the fact there were plenty of archaeological programs on BBC4, 
There are written in such amount there that rather prove my point. BBC4 is a niche that we really ought to be escaping from. We should be providing accurate programming concerning archaeology on several other channels without it being subsumed into the ever overshadowing block of history. This is where Time Team, which can't be denied, had its own problems, succeeded. It built up a picture of the past through the use of illustrations, mapping, and even experimental archaeology in a way that drew in a significant portion of viewers and worked very successfully. In this country, Time Team is, of course, synonymous with archaeology, but perhaps worryingly, TARDIS in the public psyche as blokes with beards in daft hats scrabbling in the dirt. There is a large section of the populace who are put off by anything that outright projects itself as university-led. This has a home snugly within the safe, warming, teak-lined rooms of BBC4. This, of course, does not mean that programmes such as Digging for Britain are in any way wrong, but they are focused entirely on delivering information to people who are more or less already in the know. We should not balk at the idea of providing information to people who see themselves as uninterested. I realise that a lot of you in the room now may have in your minds that there's not all academics. But to your credit, the point does not rest entirely on you. It's not the fault of academics for this in the slightest. It does, however, get hackles raised. But I think for a surprising number, there's a bit of a point missed here. For a lot of people, it does not matter how well-intentioned you are or how educational and informal you're trying to be. It is what you represent that can be, to a surprising number of people, total anathema. There is an outright disdain for anything outrightly university-led for a strongly held belief that this comes from a total bubble outside of the real world, something that is particularly compounded by people who have to live in close proximity to students. <laughs> this is the perfect example in that a Durham student rugby team uh, created an event about the miners versus the Tory government. And in particular, draw yourself to where it says, think pickaxes, think headlamps, think 12% unemployment in 1984. Now, of course, if you don't know where Durham is, it's in the Northeast and it's a heavy mining area. As you can see, that's the problem that we seem to have. But this is a separate deep-rooted problem, not just in archeology span that exists across all levels of society and has been ground in the fabric of our country for centuries. It's something universities are continuing to try and change. It's difficult to change, but it's worth bearing in mind. Working in commercial archaeology is a completely different social experience to that of academic research days. And I'm sure many of you know who've worked for any great length of time in commercial archaeology are aware. This is particularly true for long-lasting urban excavations with daily contact with people in the street and those in the building trades working around you on site. What we can and should strive for is a combination of the two, and the fact that commercial archaeology is rather blatantly missing from various media platforms highlights the problems we face. Of course, televising commercial archaeology is next to impossible, with building developers probably quite rightly refusing to allow it. A successful archaeological television show would highlight the wealth of fascinating and interesting archaeology on display, and the result would of course be outcry because it was being, uh, being removed and put, housing developments put in its place. Take a great deal to present commercial archaeology as a positive, when even as we archaeologists see it as a bit of an oxymoron. It's great to find all of this archaeology here. It's also followed swiftly by the thought, oh bugger, there's so much archaeology here, we've only got three weeks to do it, oh my god. So what we see is the structure of the present media in place. It seems rigid because perhaps we make no effort to change it. The way we are presented in the media for the moment then is something that would take a serious push to change, but it is possible. And in order to help us do that, we must turn to other methods to improve, adapt, and allow the perception of archaeology positively flourish. For academia, the ideas of community outreach have its own set parameters. A meeting tends to be set up, a workshop created, or a school group is brought into a certain environment where the central purpose is education. While this is also quite typically the case for commercial archaeology through the use of similar methods of community outreach, there's a far greater level of everyday interaction, from meeting people in the street, the cafe, and of course, more often not, the local pub to questions yelled through or over the fence surrounding the excavation work, such as, have you found any gold yet? And are you digging up dinosaurs? These have far greater implications than the more typical centralized safe area of education. For the public in these scenarios, there's no sense of the threat of potentially being educated. And so more often than not, they're actually very receptive to ideas being presented. A change in environment such as this, where commercial archeology span can work in your favour can be conducive to education, especially when you're covered head to toe in clots and high-vis gear. 
This is heavily compounded by the uh, particular curiosity and therefore being entirely honest, downright nosiness of the public and finding out what's going on in the backyard. Local history is a fascination that should not be ignored and achieves all levels of society as an immediate spark of commonality and incredibly tangible link to the past. There's an important point to remember when considering the diversity of our profession and how we as an archaeologist present the story of the past in this country. As many of you have seen online, there was a rather significant upset from certain members of society in regards to a BBC cartoon presenting a black Roman soldier, as you can see behind me. This was picked up by Mary Beard over Twitter and led to waves of abuse. We as archaeologists should be doing more to illustrate a more diverse portrait of the past and when we find it. Although in Mary Beard's case there's quite a significant amount of rampant racist and sexist abuse from people using Twitter who believe that there are no serious consequences for what they say, there's also a good portion of people who generally had little idea about the apparently curious notion that an empire as large as the Roman one happened to have different people spread across it. Although it seems against common sense, it's not been without a strong push from archaeologists ourselves and a not too distant past and fermenting idea that movement of people did not occur. This idea of black Romans in Britain is something that has been an academic thought for a long time, but the trickle-down effect of this is very slow. This, of course, is not helped by the television and movies, which do nothing to help further more recent theories and ideas in our collective fields. And indeed, it's difficult when you have certain newspapers in this country who do their utmost to disparage anything and everything. Such as this, which is just fantastic. I'd, I'd recognize. I'd, I'd say you should read it at some point. It's great. Um, this is two years ago. Um, yeah, it's classic data. I feel that the way we build up stories of the past, even down to basic things like archaeological illustration or artist interpretations, are fundamentally behind this problem. If there is no representation, then people of color will feel alienated from the past, lose interest, and so we lose out on a wealth of information as a result. When ideas like this do drop a supposed bombshell on the mind of the general public, I argue it's up to us as archaeologists to discuss this and provide the wealth of evidence we have from this. That in the future, things like this do not occur as frequently or as harshly there's more of a stronger idea of diversity in the past in the minds of the general public in this country. This is where archaeological conversation, uh, conservation can really work in our favour. Now, if you thought archaeology didn't have much of a media presence, conservation has even less. Now, like the techniques that we use promote the idea of detective work, which garners so much interest. Often, archaeologists use these techniques without reference in conservation being involved. And this led to one of the successes in Time Team. It showed archaeologists working through a problem what scientific techniques we use to help us, guide us, and um, what, how what we find makes us build up a picture. And briefly, just talk about the um, this, which is the um, Celtic warrior grave at the National Museum of Wales. Uh, it was done in 1996, um, and it was a whole learning platform involving killing somebody, watching the remains change and showing what was left and why. And it was taught at lots of school groups across Wales. Uh, yeah. So, it's through these methods of outreach that can bridge an important gap as a starting point for interest in the past and from where we can advance people's knowledge. This is where social media can truly come into its own. Now, a lot of people argue for and against the use of social media in the promotion of archaeology. Personally, I believe it is a useful tool, although perhaps not something we can fully rely upon. It will not supplant old media platforms like television and radio, but it can be used to our advantage when working alongside these other communication vehicles. As Sarah Perry and Nicole Beale stated in their 2015 article, archaeology is discussed on social media with or without archaeologists. Therefore, it is up to us to present our narrative on those platforms. This can be done in a variety of ways, and we are certainly missing out on some of the basics. Even just regular shots of archaeologists at work, which I showed previously, showcasing what we do would be a good start. It's not so much the objects that are missing from our narrative, but we as excavators and storytellers. The things we uncover are a tangible link to those who've come before us. Certain objects can cut through the mists of time and create connections between the past and the future. Pottery with thumb marks from a potter shaping their vessel. Animal prints like this one behind that have cats' footprints on them have always reminded us that cats are cheeky little rascals. Medieval nickums are something that elicits such a vivid response, particularly to those who went through that horror as children, are a good example as well. People long for the everyday as much as they are excited by the exotic. Combining the two is a win-win in archaeology. Through social media, we can present these things to the public in our own fashion. We can use it to change the narrative in ways that we couldn't before. So if you imagine the majority of the public mindset is about 20, 30 years behind what we know through modern research, you begin to understand the problem. 
Academic journals are not easy to get a hold of, and by the time recent research may eventually reach the public, it's already at least five years out of date. That is something that can be changed through use of social media. Looking further in the future, it will not be long before VR becomes a staple of the museum environment. It will be up to us to promote that and provide an accurate representation in a setting unlike any other. Presenting a comprehensive, accurate and cohesive story of the past is a challenge. We have a significant amount of methods available to us in order to present that story to the public. Simply talking to people is a great start. Being able to present ideas and prompt debate helps our profession flourish. If we remain looking inward and only share our knowledge with people through journal articles, we will miss out on so much and we stuck as being thought of as either dinosaur hunters or architects, or even worse, the bumblebees. That's it.